All right, uh, the, this evening, as I mentioned this morning, and I've already mentioned this evening, we're going to look at the conclusion of this, uh, well, of this um, encounter that Jesus had with the rich young ruler, um, what, how the disciples responded uh, to this, and of course, the main question they had was, uh, since we have fulfilled what it is you asked the rich young ruler to do, uh, what, what's in it for us? You know, what are we going to get? And uh, that's what we need to look at and to realize that what they would receive is, is essentially the same thing that we can expect to receive, having also by His grace uh, met the qualifications. So let me just read the, uh, I believe, what, three verses here, Luke 18, verses 28 through 30. Peter said, Behold, we have left our own homes and followed you. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who will not receive many times as much at this time and in the age to come eternal life. May the Lord bless uh, this portion of his word to our, um, uh, our edification uh, this evening. Now again, this morning we're reminded of what the Lord calls us to do if we would be his disciples and finally enter into his kingdom. A ruler, as we saw, who was extremely wealthy, approached Jesus with the question, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, you know the commandments, do these things, do this, as the law says, and you will live. Now apparently he thought he had done what um, Jesus told him, or uh, he had to do what the law of God said, but he must have missed the memo. He must have missed what Job said in, in Job 14, verse 4, who can make the clean out of the unclean? No one. There is no one who can commend themselves to God. We are all under his wrath. Well, rather than dispute with him, Jesus instead preached the gospel to him, and what he said was not unique to the rich young ruler but something that he calls all of us to do if we are to follow him. Give up all your possessions and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Now, this evening we're going to, to uh, note this and I, I did note it this morning, but we want to look a little bit more carefully at it. Jesus didn't in those days nor today always require the complete liquidation of all of our assets and their distribution, of course, to the needy. I mean, we're actually um, in the next chapter going to be introduced to another rich tax collector who willingly gave when uh, Jesus basically told him, Zacchaeus, you know, today I'm going to dine in your house. He willingly gave half of everything that he owned, half to the poor, and offered to pay back four times as much if, is, if he had defrauded anyone, and Jesus will declare to him, uh, today salvation has come to this house because he too is a child of Abraham, not just a natural child, but a spiritual child. So Jesus doesn't always require the complete liquidation of all assets. Perhaps he required this ruler to test him, to see if he really did love the kingdom of God enough to give up everything that he might have it. That is what the Lord says uh, should be in our hearts if we really have his grace. Well, as we know, the result was he couldn't. He couldn't give it up. He was very rich. But the Bible tells us that no one really can unless the Father gives us His Holy Spirit to open our eyes and to show us the reality and the desirability of the kingdom. Once He does that, then we will gladly give whatever we have to give in order to possess the treasure. Well, at this point, Peter turns to Jesus to point out that uh, this is what they had done. He says in verse 28, Behold, we have left our own homes and followed you. Now, granted, they didn't have nearly as much as the rich young ruler, but they did have some things. Peter and James and John and Andrew were, were fishermen, and they likely had some well-used fishing nets and perhaps some old boats we know that Peter had a house in Capernaum. Uh, likely it was a very humble dwelling by the standards of the day. I think um, those who have been to the Holy Land perhaps have seen Capernaum. I, I've seen pictures of it. It was actually a very small town. 
they didn't look very illustrious. Um, uh, so anyway, he had a, a domicile. Matthew had a little bit more. He was a successful businessman. Remember, he was a tax collector, and he left his booth to follow Jesus. But I think the fact that they didn't have as much, in some sense, made it easier for them to answer the call of Jesus, didn't it? And we have to ask ourselves the question, which would be more difficult, humanly speaking, to give up a mansion or to give up a shack, you know, uh, to give up a Mercedes or to give up a Volkswagen, although Volkswagens are getting a little bit better uh, these days than they used to be. Uh, riches, we know, Jesus tells us over and over again, can be a snare, which is why Jesus says in Luke 6, verse 20, blessed are you who are poor. For yours is the kingdom of God. And why James writes this in James 2 verse 5, Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? Now we know that the Lord can overcome the hearts of either the rich or the poor, and he has to do so before either will come to him. But it certainly appears in Scripture that he favors the poor. Of course, the reason why they were poor to begin with was because that was a part of his plan, perhaps to show them their need of the Lord Jesus. I think I told you that when we used to, in Calvary Chapel years ago, we did something that was be called blockbusting, at least that's what it was called by the, by the church, and we went out to various places, and when we went to very poor and depressed areas, we got a great response, a lot of people to talk to, but when we tried it in more affluent places, it was much more difficult. People didn't want to talk to us there. So... Wealth versus poverty. When you're impoverished, you see your need much more, um, you know, much more clearly. But now the disciples, they may not have haven't, uh, really had to give up much by way of materials, but we have to realize they had something that was much more precious to them than their boats and their nets, and that was their families, right? Some of them were married. Uh, Peter, we know, had a wife. He had a mother-in-law. Uh, we don't read about children, but I don't think it's much of a stretch to assume that, that you know, some of them, most of them perhaps had some, and certainly all of them had parents and brothers and sisters. Now, having families would have made it much more difficult to go with Jesus, but as Peter told Jesus, we did. We left them all, and the fact that they could do this shows that they had God's grace. So this is the evidence. We've answered the call, Jesus. We, we've done what you said. Now, Matthew tells us that there was a reason why Peter said what he said. It's not expressed here, but it is in Matthew's gospel because he had a follow-up question for Jesus. We read in Matthew 19, verse 27. Then Peter said to him, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. What then will there be for us? You know, what, what do we get out of this? Well, Jesus had just told the ruler that if he would sell everything and give it to the poor and follow Jesus, that he would have treasure in heaven. Now, the disciples had really done what Jesus required. And so the question is, what could they expect? You know, our Lord does not call us to give up everything we have and follow him for nothing. We have to remember the parables we were looking at this morning, the parable of the treasure in the field, the parable of the pearl of great price. The man in the parable who sold all that he had to purchase the field did actually gain something, right? He gained the treasure, which was much more valuable than what he possessed. And the pearl merchant who was, um, uh, well, who parted with all of his merchandise uh, obtained something as well, that pearl of great price, something to him which was much more valuable than what he had to give up. They gave up something to gain something. Peter wants to know what that something is. And so Jesus tells him in verses 29 and 30, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who will not receive many times as much at this time and in the age to come, eternal life. So this is the package, so to speak. So let's, let's take a look at some of these things because... Um, it may not be obvious, at least some of the things on the surface. Now, notice first that what Jesus says here does not apply only to the disciples, but it applies to everyone who will answer his call to follow him on these terms. He says there is no one 
who has left these things for the sake of the kingdom of God, who will not receive many times as much in this time and, of course, the other things in the, the, the time that is coming. So this is for us as well. Now, bear in mind, secondly, <clears throat> that in most cases, the giving that Jesus was calling them to do was only temporary, at least in, in certain aspects. We do need to remember that Jesus was calling them to itinerant work, which means we're going to be moving around a lot, okay? To travel with Him all over Palestine meant that they needed to leave their houses, they needed to leave their professions, they needed to leave their possessions, they needed to leave their families. And this is what Jesus, more often than not, calls us to do, is to leave them temporarily, and more often than what He said, of course, to, to the ruler. Now, if we read through the Gospels, we'll notice that even after Jesus called Peter, and Peter followed Him, that Peter still had a house, right? It still belonged to him. Jesus stayed with him when he was in Capernaum. That was their headquarters. When he was in Galilee, that's where they stayed. Peter still had a wife. He still had a mother-in-law. Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law while he was staying with them in Capernaum. They still had parents. They still had other family members. And Jesus reminded them that they still had duties that they needed to perform towards them. Remember how Jesus rebuked the Pharisees on one occasion for telling their disciples that they could abandon their obligation towards their parents for the sake of their tradition. It was really for the sake of the Pharisees that they might gain more wealth from them. Uh, Jesus says in Matthew 7, verses 10 through 13, Moses said, honor your father and your mother. And he who speaks evil of father or mother is to be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father or mother, whatever I have that would help you is Corban, that is to say given to God, you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or his mother, thus invalidating the word of God by your tradition, which you have handed down, and you do many things such as that. So Jesus is basically telling us here, we can't forsake them. We have an obligation towards them, so it can only be temporary. And I want you to notice something else about this passage. How could they do anything for their parents if they had really liquidated all that they had and given it to the poor and they were following Jesus, right? They had to have possessions in order to help their parents. Jesus doesn't always call us to leave our home and family absolutely, but He does sometimes temporarily. And if he does, even for a longer period of time, uh, Jesus is telling us we must be willing uh, to do that. You know, mission, missionaries sometimes leave their homes for many years. You know, some can afford to maintain a home while they're on the mission field. Uh, others can't. Some give that up. They go to the mission field. Uh, others, we know, um, have had to leave their children in boarding schools uh, for many years because of the difficulties that they have to face in the particular areas they believe the Lord is calling them to serve. Uh, I think it's less likely the case, or less often the case today, but it's still the case. You know, David Livingston left his wife and his children in Scotland, I believe because he originally went to Africa with his wife and children. I believe he lost a daughter there, so he sent them back to Scotland and uh, basically for, the, for his wife to take care of his children there because of the harsh conditions that exist in Africa. Sometimes the price uh, of serving the Lord is quite high, uh, and we have to be willing to pay that price. But our Lord is telling us here that it's worth it because the compensation that He will give to us is also very high. As a matter of fact, it, it's much higher than what it is we have to give up. So what is that? What, what, is, what do we get, as Peter asked? Well, first of all, Jesus says that we will receive many times as much at this time, that is, in this life. Now, I know the health and wealth gospel movement has, um, has basically used passages like this to, to prove that uh, when we give, we get, you know. 
Um, we get, you know, we give to the Lord, we get many times as much. If we give to the Lord, he gives back to us, pressed down, shaken together, running over. I don't know how many times I heard that passage in one of the churches I was in, sadly, uh, when I was just uh, a, a very young teenager, okay? But Jesus is not teaching a health and wealth gospel here. He's not teaching us to give in order that we might become rich. I mean, why would we assume that that's the case? Well, because Jesus has already warned us about the pitfalls of wealth. And, and he's told us about the blessing basically on the poor. Woe to you rich, he says in Luke chapter 6, because you're receiving your comforts in full. But what Jesus is telling us here is, is that if we have to leave our resources for a time, that he's going to make other resources available to us. And though we might have to leave our families temporarily, we're going to find that we have a much larger family that is also committed to supporting us. And that family is called the body of Christ. As a matter of fact, they are the ones who will provide the resources that we would need to carry on his work that we had to leave our resources and our families in order to do. Uh, they will open up their homes to us. They will help us in the work that we are doing. And we understand how the body of Christ is supposed to work, and we understand how it often does work uh, in this world. We help one another to do what the Lord has called us to do. And by the way, how can the Lord's people actually provide for us unless they have something that they can provide? Again, it, it shows us the necessity of, of personal possessions, of personal property. Uh, we know in Scripture there were examples of um, those who sold their, you know, their uh, properties and gave the proceeds to the apostles to distribute to those who were in need. But that was a particular time and a particular need. That wasn't supposed to be the norm for the, the church. It, it was because um, the Lord had saved a lot of people on the day of Pentecost uh, they had come to that feast expecting to be there only for a week because that's how long it lasted, and then to go home. But they were saved, and they needed to stay there to be discipled. And the needs began to grow, and there were Christians who had property who were following Jesus, who were willing to sell that property and give it to them, but it was within their power to do or not to do, as uh, Peter reminded Ananias and Sapphira uh, with regard to the property they sold and holding back part of the price. Okay, so there is personal property, and that property, when the Lord calls us, puts it on our hearts to, to use it for His glory that, that we give. So uh, there is the, the greater resources of the body of Christ. There is the family of uh, the body of Christ. So the point is basically this. The Lord doesn't call all of us to give everything away, as He did the rich young ruler. But sometimes He does call us to give a portion of what He has given to us to his cause. I think most of us will likely fill that particular role, providing for those who have given it more to go out and to serve the Lord and to do his work, perhaps on the mission field, than actually giving those things up ourselves to go on the mission field. And how do I know that? Well, because I, I see all of us here and we're not on the mission field. So we're, we're doing what the Lord has called us to do and what he's called us to do is support those that he has raised up to go on the field. So the first thing is that if we give these things up, we will receive many more of the same kind uh, in this life at this time. Now Mark adds one more thing that we can expect to receive in this world, which at first doesn't seem like a great thing. Uh, in Mark 10, verses 29 through 30, Jesus says this, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms, so far, what basically Jesus says in Luke, but then he adds this, along with persecutions. <laughs> so here's one more thing we can expect. When we answer the call to forsake all and to follow Jesus, we must be willing at the same time to endure hatred from the worlds because when we follow Jesus, of course, we stand out, right? And Jesus told us, he, well, told us, he warns us in John 15, verse 19, if you are of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, 
but I chose you out of the world. Because of this, the world hates you. Don't expect to be rich and famous in the world if you're going to follow Jesus. Uh, what you can expect is persecution, right? Um, Paul writes this to Timothy, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It was certainly true then, and we know that is the case today. Just, just stand out publicly, and, and you'll see what happens. But even this, our Lord, can turn to a blessing, and He actually intends it to be a blessing to us. Think about what Paul wrote. If there is one person outside of our Lord Jesus Christ who suffered persecution for the gospel, it was him. This is what he writes to the Colossians in Colossians 1 verse 24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction. Notice he was doing uh, his share on behalf of the body, which is the church, which means that the church had its share also in this to fill up what was lacking in Christ's afflictions, which doesn't mean that Jesus didn't suffer enough in order to save us, but it does mean that the world has not yet vented all of its hatred against Christ. And so since they can't reach him any longer, they will go after his people. That's the reason why Jesus said, the world will hate us. And you know, there, as, as our, well, as Paul reminds us here, there is no greater honor than to stand in our Lord's place and take the abuse that the world has for Him, even as He took the world's abuse for us. So even persecution, which is a part of the package, can even turn to a blessing if we don't try to avoid it and compromise to avoid it, but rather continue to profess the Lord and endure it, our rewards will be greater in this life and in the next. But of course, the best is yet to come. Jesus says we not only will receive these things now, but in the age to come, we'll receive eternal life. And eternal life, as you know, is simply a, a summary way of, of talking about a package of blessings. Now, eternal life is certainly what it says on the surface, which is endless life. We'll never die, but live forever. But it's more than an escape from hell, and that's how a number of people actually look at it, you know, and uh, maybe that's the way we looked at it solely as we, we came to the Lord. I'm not going to have to go to hell. Now I can go to heaven. But, you know, there's, a, there's obviously a better way of looking at it than, than that, just endless life, not in hell. It's a personal relationship with the Father and with His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That begins on earth but continues forever. Jesus says in John 17, verse 3, this is eternal life. So here's the definition, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Now, I want you to notice that Jesus is saying it's more than just knowing about God as a theologian who studies God, I mean, there are liberal theologians who know a lot more about God than we know because they study the Bible more, but they don't know Him, you see. That's what Jesus says, eternal life is to know Him in a personal relationship. As a child knows and experiences the love of their father, that's what it means to be in relationship with Him. Jesus prayed that the Father might give to us this relationship in his high priestly prayer. He says in John 17, verses 25 through 26, O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these have known that you sent me, and I have made your name known to them and will make it known so that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. Jesus was essentially praying that God the Father would give to his disciples the Holy Spirit so that they might know the Father, that they might be in this loving relationship with the Father. Because it is through the Holy Spirit that he reveals to us really what we have through the Lord Jesus Christ, what eternal life really is. I think that's what Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians 2 verses 9 through 10 where he says this, 
as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which, is not, or which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. For to us, God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. The Holy Spirit is essentially the down payment of our inheritance. And he's the one who reveals what is waiting for us in heaven. And what the Spirit of God is, of course, is a principle of holy love. He gives us love for God. And of course, coming to Jesus, trusting in him, we have that relationship with God. But we've experienced just a foretaste of what we will experience in the future, which is essentially when we're in heaven being swallowed up in his love forever. You know, I think one of the, uh, one of the things we experience in this world, which is the, you know, one of the greatest things we experience, of course, is love. Certainly that which motivates us more than anything else uh, to give up things that we might possess uh, the object of our love. We know what a blessing it is. Well, here is infinite love that will be swallowed up in and in joy forever. And if we really understand what that means, then we see that that by itself is worth anything that we might have to give up here because we just have a little taste of it. It was enough to change the whole direction of our lives. But there, we're going to experience it in its fullness. But there's more, of course. We know from the scriptures that we will also see God in heaven, His glory, that which is called the beatific or blessed vision. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means we're going to see something that is beautiful. And if we think that natural beauty in this world is something worth looking at, infinite beauty is far more. And the Bible says we will gaze at him forever. And we will never grow tired of what it is we're looking at because he is so beautiful. We'll also worship him there, expressing our love to him along with a perfect family uh, for the rest of time. There may be other things we do, but I'm, I'm not sure exactly how we could turn our gaze away from the Lord long enough to do anything else, right? And then lastly, <clears throat> we'll inherit the kingdom. And that kingdom, as we know, is the new heavens and the new earth that is illuminated or lit by the glory of the Father and the Son, where there's going to be no more suffering, no more death, only perfect peace and love and joy for the rest of time. So that, that's the package. And, and the question we need to ask is, does this sound like it's worth the loss of whatever we might have to give up on earth in order to possess? The rich young ruler didn't think it was. But obviously, if we have trusted Jesus and we're pursuing the kingdom, we do believe that it is because the Lord has opened our eyes. We do need to understand that we do not lose anything if we have gained the Lord Jesus because what we have to gain, the treasure, the pearl of great price, is worth much more than anything we could possibly have in this world. Well, may the Lord uh, help us to see that and may he help us to pursue that with the kind of zeal that that kind of desire should bring out of us. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to, um, to help us to see it and help us to pursue it.